Welcome, friends. This is your monthly show, Divided We Fall, where Pat Byrne and I discuss what's wrong with the left and how to fix it. And today it's the third episode, and we're going to discuss on the second element. Uh, last time uh, we discussed was almost a month ago, and we concluded that the left today is largely locking uh in ideology and that this is one of the main factors that uh contribute to its overall weakness and uh we also concluded that we don't want to be very pessimistic about the left in general although the situation is not on the other hand very optimistic but we definitely want to be able to demonstrate that there are ways forward ways out of the mess that we uh, f uh we are in at the moment largely at least mm. and uh today we'd like to speak uh to pat about how a coherent viable left socialist alternative could be put forward to the white public and how the left-wing ideology can be strengthened or maybe even regained to a large extent so, Pat, uh, where do we start with this? Well, as, as you recall, for those of you who've watched our previous sessions, uh, I have talked about the, the left having lost its ideology. Um, and, and they lost its ideology basically in the 1990s with the fall of the Soviet bloc and the collapse of social democratic ideas. And these were the two big, seen by the world's population as the two big examples of socialism in practice uh, to one degree or another. And uh, with, with the collapse of the, 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 the Soviet bloc and social democracy, um, you know, the ideology of the left um, kind of died as well. I know that, that there was probably many people on the left who were critical of both of these trends and who probably thought that with their collapse that maybe it was opening the way for more democratic ideas or, or other ideas to come forward. But sadly, the left didn't get together and didn't review what happened and didn't come up with a new ideology or a program. And so as a result, since that time in the 1990s, we've had this huge vacuum in politics internationally. Um, and, uh, and the whole project of socialism has had a massive uh, question mark over it. Now, now what, I, what, what do we need to do to overcome that? Well, first of all, I think that we have to set about, the left needs to get together and to set about developing a new ideology and a new program. And I don't think we should be pessimistic because I, I gave the example in previous sessions about how in, in a in somewhat similar, a similar situation in the collapse of their ideology, the right wing, or the capitalist right, um, through the neoliberal movement, they themselves started off in a very weak position in the, in the 1940s. And they developed um, their ideology, they developed ideas and they, over a period of 20, 30 years, um, they were able to go from a position of being a small force working against the mainstream to becoming the dominant force in capitalism internationally. Um, now, I'm not saying that we need to take so long as that because nowadays um, the world moves much faster than it did in those uh, decades. But I think if, we, if we're willing to, to do the work and, and analyze what went wrong in the Soviet Union, what went wrong in social democracy, we can come up with uh, an alternative that will regain credibility among the world's population and will offer a real alternative to capitalism, which is becoming so unpopular today. Okay, so but before, before you continue, <clears throat> sorry, because you, you used, uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of um, sentence, uh, but, but you made a statement that we need to develop a new ideology and program, which I think to many people might sound a bit intimidating, like, you know, we are uh, mm. re... Uh, reinventing socialism or something like that and there's been there have been experiments like you know uh, many uh, weird notions were developed like for example the socialism of the 21st century as if it was supposed to be somehow different than the socialism of the 19th or the 20th century so uh, could you uh, somehow uh, uh, maybe appease or or, or uh, try to uh, speak to that like it's not it's not like we're reinventing it. It's like we're building up on something where the foundations were laid long ago. Is that is that correct? Well, yes. I mean, we're not we're not um, 
as you say, we're not, we're not, uh, we don't have to remake the wheel, as they say. Um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, but what we have to do is we have to, you know, if we regard us, if we regard socialism as a scientific approach to politics and to society, then we need to do what scientists do. That when when you when your experiment has failed, you need to then examine what went wrong and then learn from that, so that the next experiment you make will work. And that's how science develops. That's how politics should be developing. And um, that's what we need to do. We, we've had a we've had a long experience of uh, attempts at socialism in the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, um, other parts of the world, also uh, attempts at socialism through social democracy. And <clears throat> the, the problem that we've seen, and the, under, the, the biggest problem we've seen, is that they've all ended up being very much, as we talked about, this top-down bureaucratic version of socialism that has, uh, that has not worked very well, that has been ended up with very uh, great inefficiency. Um, it's, had, it's had some successes, it's delivered... Uh, you know, it's got, it certainly had some successes, like in the Soviet Union. It took the Soviet Union from being a very backward country to being, um, you know, a, a modern country, but at great cost. Um, you could also argue that social democracy has brought great benefits in terms of social services, a welfare state, and so forth to, uh, to people. Um, but it hasn't ultimately um, succeeded in proving a, 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 a successful alternative to capitalism which is why um, the neoliberals in particular were able to undermine the ideology of uh, the Soviet bloc and of social democracy. And combined with their failures in, in the 90s, uh, we saw that they, they collapsed. So obviously we can learn from that. So as you say, we're not having to reinvent the wheel. We've got a lot of um, experience behind us. But we, if we learn from what went wrong, then we can uh, we can certainly uh, move forward, and that's what exactly. So where we've gone, that's what the left hasn't done. That that's the big, the yeah. big problem. Okay, so that's the starting point. Like we analyze yeah. our mistakes, and that's something. Yeah. Uh, and we, we, we quite rightly, you said we we, we discussed that uh, in in the previous episodes, and uh, the establishment, like the starting point here, is that the social democracy uh, failed largely okay mm -hmm. and the soviet union failed or at least failed you know i, I personally i don't like to uh, to use that uh, form you you know th this um this particular phrase that it's a failure that so the soviet union failed well, because it, 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 you know yeah. uh, actually it what, what it failed it failed to sustain itself that's what it failed right. at exactly. otherwise the, the, there's been many many victories okay in terms of the mm -hmm. civilizational upgrade of the entire uh, you know soviet uh, society yeah. Mm -hmm. And many societies around the Soviet Union that were uh, influenced or, or were part of the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union, like the Eastern Bloc and, and so on and so forth. So uh, we start from this. And, and uh, how about you? Um, uh, it, how about we start actually from what you uh, what you said about the top down structure and deficits of democracy? Because I think that it's it's important to, uh, to note that. It, it's actually common, it's a mutual thing for both of the wings, okay, for the social democracy in the West and for the Soviet style, uh, Soviet Union style socialism in the East, despite the fact that we're, these deficits of democracy were manifesting themselves in a, you know, somewhat different manner, okay, and, and, and different intensity uh, and structure. But uh, this is something that seems to be the common denominator uh, or maybe even the indicator of the failure. What do you say to that? Well, certainly, um, I, I would agree with that. That, that the the common um, threads um, the, of, of problems we've had have been that we we you know when Marx and Engels were um, coming forward with their ideas in the nineteenth century, they kind of automatically assumed that. Once you established, um, once you, you know, once you abolished uh, the the main forms of capitalism in a society, and you established public ownership, uh, you know, public services, planning, and so on, then uh, that the the working class and working people generally would be in the driving seat of that society. But sadly, it didn't work out that way. And in every example we've seen. Um, 
for one reason or another, um, they, the working people have ended up being actual subjects rather than being in power. They ended up being ruled over by uh, governments and officials, um, and they've not been able to be, uh, you know, running industries, running public services, or whatever it is. And this applies not just to the Soviet bloc, for example. Um, it also applies to um, social democracy. So, in the West, uh, we had all kinds of, um, you know, all kinds of industries taken to public ownership. We saw the massive expansion of the welfare state, introduction of public services, etc. Um, plus the state itself. But in no cases were the ordinary workers in those services, the customers, the service users, whatever it might be, were they in the driving seat of those uh, industries? And in fact, um, the, 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 and, and this led to a massive bureaucracy, uh, which was remote from the ordinary people and was not under their control. And so uh, we have to analyze um, uh, why was that? And we have to say that from now on, all our programs, um, have to have to include as a key part, central part, that we're going to put ordinary people in charge of these institutions, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's actually the most efficient thing to do. I mean, it doesn't make sense um, <clears throat> for decisions to be made where the workers who, who know, you know, the day to day um, uh, requirements of that work, um, who've got great experience, for them not to be involved in any way in the decision making. And the same for the people who are receiving these products or using these products and services. Why would, why would we have a system where they're not allowed to have any say in them? It doesn't make any sense. But of course, it makes sense in a capitalist sense, in the capitalist world, because these companies, the capitalist companies, are only interested in, um, you know, making profit. So they don't, they don't want customers to have a, have a say in what the pricing of the products will be. They don't want them to uh, having, have any say of the quality of the products. They don't want their workers to have a say because then the workers will start to start to say, let's stop this exploitation, you know, where you get these uh, low wages being paid to the workers, et cetera. Um, so, that, so obviously capitalist companies don't want um, uh, this kind of democracy to, uh, to operate in their companies. And when you have a capitalist country, they don't want that kind of democracy to operate in the public sector either, because then that would be would make them more efficient and more competitive against the capitalist companies. But unfortunately, for historical many historical reasons, the same problem appeared in in what was supposed to be socialist countries where capitalism had been abolished, and um, that's a that's a shame. You know, um, I, I think <clears throat> I mean there's a lot there's a lot I, I'd like to outline. Um, you know, some basic ideas of what an alternative, uh, a democratic socialist alternative might look like. Um, I think it will take, uh, you know, perhaps a couple of programs for us to really lay this out. And, 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 and I want to come back to this key question of how could we democratically um, ensure people's participation on all the decisions that affect them. But I would like, first of all, if I, if I, if I be possible, to outline how how we could actually run the economy in a practical way in, in a democratic social society. Um, I'd like to go through that, if that's okay. Would that be possible? Yeah, I, uh, absolutely. I think it's totally okay. And, and I think it also makes sense that you perhaps outline the general architecture. So on the one hand, we have the economy. On the other hand, we have the, the question of democracy, internal democracy of the party, of the institutions, and so on and so forth, uh, plus the democracy within the state uh, and, and the way we, we see that. Uh, mm. and, uh, and also, I think it's very important, uh, and that speaks to the, que to the question of democracy, how do we defend you know, socialism? Uh, because I think that many people, including myself actually, have the tendency to think that many of the deficits of democracy were also caused by the fact that the socialist countries or the countries that adopted the Soviet model, a model were, uh, you know, to a large extent besieged fortresses, and and that you know m compelled some leaders at least to uh, mm, to use dictatorial measures that were never called off uh, eventually. Mm. Uh, so I think that's also an element to uh, probably consider. 
here. I think I think you're right, but there's also perhaps even more fundamental than that. Is I think that that the revolution broke out uh, in very backward countries, which was not uh, you know the not the intention of, of Marx and Engels in the in the 19th century. They were expecting the most advanced capitalist countries where the working class was becoming the majority of the population. They were expecting those to be the countries that would adopt socialism. But it, 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 capitalism broke at its weakest link and we saw revolutions in some of the poorest countries in the world. And it was very difficult for them to make the leap from that situation to an advanced socialist um, society. So I think that was perhaps as big, if not probably much bigger, and that more long-term problem that those societies uh, face. But that's, that's another whole story which is interesting to talk about. But coming forward to um, the situation now, um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in, in arguing for kind of socialist utopias. I know this has become a little bit fashionable among some sections of the left, but I, I'm not into utopias. I'm, I'm in favor, and, and I don't think we can convince people, I, unless we can come forward with practical ideas, practical proposals for how we could replace capitalism and how we could move on the road to socialism. And that's the second point I'd like to make, is that I'm not, I'm not here going to talk about exactly how that socialism would look in the final analysis. It would be difficult to, to say that because that could be 50 years ahead, I don't know, uh, or longer. But um, I'm interested in putting forward things that we could do uh, on, on the transition towards socialism. So if you imagine if, if the working people were to come to power in a particular country, what would they do You know, if, with that power and with that control? So the next point I'd also like to make is that um, I'm going to talk mainly about advanced urbanized countries. Um, the countries, the poorer countries, um, it, it's, a, it's a more complex uh, situation because they have to deal with um, uh, quite large elements of uh, you know individual ownership of farms and, pr and private enterprise and so on. Um, and that we could always talk about later on, but I want to mainly talk about the advanced countries. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> um, I'm also wanted to say just before beginning is that I don't, I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to put forward a highly detailed scheme, some kind of blueprint. I think this will be pointless because we don't know where and when a decisive change in power in a country will, will occur. And each country is at a different level. Uh, each country has different potential. And um, this will obviously affect how, what can be done and how quickly. So I think that I don't want to go into great detail, but what we can do, I think, is we can, we can lay out a general outline of the direction we should take, uh, you know, the kind of general principles and um, uh, way, way forward. <clears throat> now, one of, the, one of the, the mistakes of the past uh, that was made in the Soviet Union, was made in China, <clears throat> was that they, the leadership of, uh, of the communist parties, um, uh, like, in, for example, in, uh, in 1928, Stalin's imposed um, uh, collectivization on agriculture uh, almost overnight. And the same thing happened in China, where Mao, in, in the Great Leap Forward in 1958 onwards, tried to, you know, collectivized all the peasants and tried to impose all kinds of schemes across the country. And um, what they thought was they believed in something like the triumph of the will. I mean, even the Nazis had a similar kind of attitude in some ways, that they thought that through the power of human will, they could just ignore the realities of, 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 of society, the limitations of the resources they had, and they could just implement what they wanted to. And, and by sheer force of will, um, they could mobilize the population and it could be achieved. But in practice, either this didn't happen or it happened at such hu great human cost. And I think this is the, you know, uh, damaged the, the development of the Soviet Union and China until the reform period um, after Mao died. Um, what, one of the things that was very interesting was Deng Xiaoping, who followed Mao, in reaction to this, he, he and the leadership of the Communist Party, which they're still following to this present day, they came to the view that you, you shouldn't impose a new policy across the country as a whole straight away. That what you needed to do is you needed to experiment. You needed to try out things and see what worked. So what they did was they would try out in one or two regions of the country or it might be in one or two industrial sectors. They would try out new ideas. 
see if they worked. And if they did, then they would apply them across the country. Or if they, they needed amendment, they would then try them out somewhere else differently, etc. And I think that that is the most sensible way in any transitional um, uh, position moving towards socialism. That's what we should do. After all, um, even you know, in every previous society, including capitalism, it never arrived to the present time fully formed. It was a process of trial and error. And in our case, I think what we should be doing is we should be experimenting but in, in a totally different context to capitalism, because we'll be doing it in the basis of advance, how best to advance the living standards and interests of the majority, uh, rather than the small minority and the capitalism, they're benefiting the rich and, and the powerful. So with these very important riders, I'd like to get into the detail. So, and and as, I, as I said, um, I'm not going to talk about how we would democratically run these things, and that's absolutely key, and I think that's the second thing we need to come on to. But what I'd like to talk about is the practical economic structure of how a democratic social society could operate. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, why focus on the economy? Some people might ask that question. I mean, I think mo most people understand that economy is central to the future of any society, but there are some people who say that, you know, we shouldn't be too economistic and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but let's remember... Uh, it was the failure of the of the Soviet, or, or when you say you say you object to failure, fair enough. I, I think I can. I think it's a much more nuanced uh, assessment of it. Um, but let's say the stagnation of the um, of the Soviet economy in the in the eighties and going into the nineties, that definitely caused a massive crisis of confidence in the system, and it uh, it, it caused a lot of people to, to compare the Soviet Union so in Eastern Europe to what was happening in the capitalist West, which was on a big boom at the time. And that was, that was the, perhaps the fundamental reason why the system fell apart and uh, was replaced by, by capitalism. That's, that's true. And let me just interject here that uh, I think it's also important that we stress that, okay, we start with the economy because, you know, you explained it, <clears> why? <throat> uh, but that, that does not mean that we intend to neglect any other issues okay sure. because there's this fashion now to uh try and divide and split the left along the lines of who's more economistic or economy oriented and who's more uh, culturally social culturally oriented and, and mm -hmm. whatever you know progressives conservatives and so on and so forth so i just want to make sure that everybody understands that we uh, object in general to this kind of uh, weird and artificial division because it is artificial and I think yeah. it's actually used uh, quite consciously by uh, you know people who are enemies of the left in order to split it and divide it but that's of course a totally different story what, uh, what is important here is that the economy as Marx many times pointed out you know decides everything in the final aftermath okay and uh, the economy uh, is uh, the starting point because this is how you break the camel's back. I mean, the, and it's been repeated by many critics of capitalism that if you want to actually challenge capitalism, then you have to challenge capitalist economy and uh, and parliamentary democracy. Mm -hmm. That these two things that are the the, the backbone of uh, the philosophy and ideology. Uh, or at least that part of the ideology that is most available to most people of the capitalist system. Well, even, but even within the left itself, I think there's been um, sometimes a very rigid interpretation of socialist ideas of Marxism, so on, where, you know, Marx had talked about the, the, sub, the economic substructure of society upon which rested all the, the superstructure of laws and culture and, and everything else. Um, and this had, and and it got interpreted that um, uh, that meant that only you know only only things that were economic were important and that they dictated everything that happened in the superstructure and that there wasn't a dialectical relationship between the two and that the superstructure and all the laws and culture and every other things that happened in society didn't have a massive effect on the substructure the economic substructure and in fact um, uh, it, it led to Marx himself uh, that was the basis on which he disassociated for himself from some of his followers in France when he, he declared himself, uh, if they are Marxist, then I'm not a Marxist. And, uh, and in fact, uh, um, Engels, in, in a very little-known letter in, in 1990, he himself admits that he and Marx, um, some, somewhat to blame, because they were trying to explain their ideas 
in a world which was very much in those days based on, you know, history was all about great figures and, and uh, religious battles. And there was no analysis in the old days about the economy and history and society. And so they were trying to correct that. But sometimes they went, perhaps they bent the stick a little bit too far and misunderstandings had occurred. So, so I agree with you that um, uh, if, you, if you look at, and if you look at, for example, what happened in the Soviet Union with Stalin's measures or with Mao's measures, they were, su- they were part of the superstructure, but they dramatically affected the economy of the country. So, you know, those examples just prove the point that superstructure and substructure of the economy, economic structure and laws and culture and so on all affect each other. Now, um, having said that, um, I think that the, obviously the economy, um, is, um, is absolutely vital to every aspect of our program. So, for example, if we want to really free uh, women and, and, and um, single parents and so forth, we have to provide the highest standard of childcare at, at either free or at lowest cost um, to everyone. And this will require significant financial resources to implement, obviously. Um, another example, if we want to stop climate change and restore the environment, we'll need major public investment in... Um, and new energy sources um, and all sorts of, of, of things. Uh, and, and that will require large financial resources from society. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, these things are absolutely crucial. And, and not only that, if, if, a, if, a social, if a democratic socialist um, society is beginning to be established in any particular country or series of countries, um, they're going to be in competition with the rest of the capitalist world. And if they are not as uh, efficient or not as... Um, uh, economically viable, if they can't develop the living standards of people at the same, at least the same rate, if not better, and I think they can, then, and if they're not able to create a dynamic and sustainable and advancing economy, then democratic socialism will not thrive and it will not be able to expand. So this is, even for the survival of, of, of democratic socialism, as we've seen in the past, getting this right is crucial. So <clears throat> that's why I'm going to talk about the economy first. Now, um, now, let me start off by saying that most societies are based on a mixed economy. Um, you know, there's no, the, in most societies, there's very rarely do you get absolutely no other form of the economy, except perhaps you, as you saw in um, a couple of decades, in uh, a few decades in the Soviet Union and in China, where they abolished all private ownership um, so that even the smallest shop or hairdresser, whatever, was working under the control or ownership of the state. But that, with that exception, most countries run on the basis of, of, of a mixed economy. Um, and if you look at capitalist society, although we call them capitalist societies, there's a, there's a lot of socialistic elements within the capitalist society. You have, you have publicly owned companies, you have uh, public services, you have workers' cooperatives, you have a voluntary sector working there. Um, and these are all non-capitalist forms in that sense, although Capitalism tends to distort them and make them work in its benefit, but they are, in essence, non-capitalist forms. The question we have to ask in such a situation is, what's the dominant economic form in a mixed, in that, in any mixed economy? And obviously in a capitalist society, the dominant form is capitalism, uh, is capitalist ownership. So these, the, in other words, in those countries, the big companies and the wealthy minority, they drive the economy, they decide on most investment and so forth. Now, in a democratic social society, it has to be very different. Um, we want to see a society where working people acting through the public sector will be the dominant force in society and that this dem- democratic public sector will lead the economy. But for a long time, in the transition to socialism, it will still need to be a mixed economy. And there's no need to take everything into public ownership as they did in the Soviet Union. Why, why on earth do we need to take every little shop and uh, every small business and so on into public? It's totally unnecessary. And, and as we know, there, there is, a, there is a, a layer of people who want to work for themselves. They don't want to work for somebody else. Or even in the best will in the world, they, they are very individualistic. They, maybe they've got different... Yeah, and there are also uh, you know, uh, workplaces which are run better privately. That's just... It could be, could be that there are some small places yes, where cafes or I don't know hairdressers. Yeah, yeah could, could be, could be. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. You, so there's no need for us to do that. But the reality in the advanced economies is that small business, although there are huge numbers of small businesses and they do provide a lot of employment, 
they're not the driver of the advanced economy of the advanced capitalist economies. In fact, in most sectors, um, I just did some research on this recently for this for this uh, document I'm writing in a moment. Um, and in most sectors in America, in Europe, and so forth, um, three to four company, companies dominate over ninety percent of economic activity in those sectors. And in many cases, just two com companies dominate over half of the sector activity. <clears throat> and, and in that way, if you look at the economy as a whole in modern capitalist countries, big business totally dominates the economy. And it's on big business that we're focused, not the small companies. We're, we're, we're happy about them to be owned by small business people and to, to, um, uh, you know, who want to do that. And in fact, ironically, we would end up supporting those small businesses in a far better way than capitalism does because the big companies don't, they pretend, you know, the, the politicians who are paid for by the big companies like the Conservatives in Britain or the Republicans in America or wherever it might be, they pretend to be, um, you know, the friends of small business, but they don't actually support them. They don't do anything for them. In fact, many times they, they agree policies that are to the direct detriment of those small businesses. So, so we've got no problem with that. Um, but it's the big business that we're interested in, what we're focusing on. And what we want to do is we want to release the grip of big business on the economy and on each sector uh, from the small minority that own and control them. And we want to use those resources and those big companies um, to bring them under the ownership and democratic control of the majority of the population. So that's what, in a democratic social society, we want to do. <clears throat> now, we would... I just wanted would, to indicate that I sure. think it's very important what you said about, uh, yeah. you know, us wanting... To, what we want, uh, you know, our goal is, in fact, the, to release the economic potential of the society and, and to let it grow, you know, uh, we're, we're, by taking away this uh, pathological grip, okay, and this blockade that is posed on the economic potential of society or societies around the world by uh, what you refer to as the big business, which is like multinational corporations or sure. uh, all kinds of you know entities which are able to dominate the economic life of a country and at the same time to dominate the political process by being able to dominate the economy. Uh, and uh, it involves, of course, things like corruption. You you, you mentioned mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, I think uh, this is a very important appeal here to all the small business people. We are, you know, with you and you should be with us because we are yeah. uh, those who are your real friends because we've got no problem with entrepreneurship as it's uh, widely alleged, actually, that, you know, socialists are against entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship uh, and, and that, uh, you know, they want to form large totalitarian governments that are going to, you know, restrain all kinds of business activity. That's that's absolutely not, the, not true. It's just mythology that is exploited by the capitalist propaganda. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you're saying about that because if you analyze the program of the, um, the conservative and right-wing parties towards small business, I I've watched over the years and the only thing they usually come forward with is we're going to release red tape. We're going to reduce the amount of bureaucratic regulations that hold you back. They don't offer anything else. They, they never offer cheaper loans to business, which is a, a life and death issue for a lot of businesses. In fact, small businesses end up paying far, far higher interest rates and with far worse... Uh, and more far higher interest. taxes. Yeah, than, than any of the businesses. I mean, if, if you talk about taxes, I mean, look at the situation that these big companies, they're not paying tax most of the time. Uh, neither are the rich. It's small businesses are having to pay the tax and the rest of the population. And, and, and look at the disadvantage that puts them at. Um, how are they supposed to compete if they've got to pay tax and the big business is not paying the tax because they've got all these big businesses have got massive amount of um, uh, of subsidiaries all based in the tax havens. So that, and they use transfer pricing and all sorts of techniques. So they they end up. I mean, look at these. You think I'm exaggerating? Look at all these big companies like um, Google, Amazon. Uh, they're not paying tax. Um, one Absolutely. country after another. Absolutely, and, fact, and their I'm, owners don't pay taxes. Like when you look no, at, at you know no. Trump's Trump's uh, tax documents or Bezos Trump's document, yeah. uh, sorry, tax yeah. documents, you will see that you know they pay peanuts. Like you know, yeah. Some, yeah, pathetic, yeah. And and then on top of that, they use their power and their influence 
to do arrange all sorts of legal things uh, to their benefit with the politicians. Of course, and subsidies. Uh, use, That's very important yeah, because they yeah. preach capitalism and free market, and they constantly yeah. get subsidies, including uh, you know banks, uh, bailouts, you know all kinds of stuff, yeah. loans, yeah. And, and and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. As a, as a as the expression developed during the Great Economic Recession, um, it's uh, it's socialism for the rich and it's capitalism for the rest. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and and um, you know, uh, there's just one in one area after another. They're using, they're abusing their power to benefit themselves, uh, and the poor small businesses are getting shafted. I mean, you just have to look at down a lot of high streets now in in America, in Britain, in in Europe, whatever, and you just see one place after another boarded up. It's sorrowful, yeah. um, and and you know, I mean, that's that's how it works. I mean. So, so that so I think it's uh, that, that 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 small business has got everything to gain from from us on the left if we include them in our in our program, which in the past we haven't tended to do very much, and I think that's an important part of what we've got to do. So, coming back onto the the, the perhaps a big a broader thing about how in a democratic social society we want to operate, there's there's five main elements that I would like to lay out for a practical economic structure for democratic socialism. First of all is democratic public planning. Secondly, democratic public investment. Thirdly, democratic public innovation. Fourthly, democratic public ownership. And fifthly, democratic public services. So <clears throat> I'd like to go through each one of those, if I may, um, and say a few yeah. words about them. Yeah, please Now, go first ahead. of all, talking about democratic public planning. Now, in one of the major problems of capitalism and capitalist countries is they ideologically against planning. Um, but this is planning for society as a whole. Ironically, within the companies themselves, um, the big companies I'm talking about now, they are using planning to the nth degree. Yeah, they, they are. are they are only against planning when it comes to the uh, to the relation between the producer and the consumer. Okay, otherwise or, they or are all. Right. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, they, they are all for planning within their corporations, within their sure. you know big firms, and so on and so they're, forth. You know, yeah. they're, they're all about. It's funny. They're all about planning, collective teamwork. Yeah. The things that they are get, are team get, building. The, you know, all yeah. the corporate no, culture. They're, yeah. they're against all these things uh, in public and, and for society as a whole. But within the company, they're in favor of them. Now, why is that? Well, that is because they know they work, yeah, and in the company, they've got a dictatorship where they, di they dictate everything from the top. And the only one, people with any power are the, 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 um, the investors uh, and the managers or the private owners of this private company. And everyone else, the workers, the customers, the suppliers, small businesses, the service, the company, etc., they all have to follow their tune and follow their dictates. And so, therefore, they're in control of everything. They're only interested in making more money for themselves. Um, and building up the company for themselves. So, of course, they've got complete power in that situation. They don't have to worry about any other external uh, much, you know, the, as much as they can, they're going to direct the company for that end. So, therefore, they've got no problem. They're going to use the most efficient way to do that. And the most efficient way is obviously to plan things and to work together collectively and use team builds, team building and all the rest of it. And because that is logical way to work any any professional people know that if you want to if you want to build something if you want to build a house do you think architects are going to build a house without a plan or a building no of course they're not they're going to make a plan they're going to plan it and the same with every group of professional workers or um, business people they know they've got to plan their sales for the coming year um the resources they're going to need for the production of uh, raw materials whatever it might be they've got to make sure it all fits together And they can only do that by planning. Uh, and the same with team working, that, they, that they, they get the employees to work together, not against each other. But outside of the company, then you come into a different ballgame because then um, in society as a whole, there are all these demands from the population, the society as a whole, for how is your company going to affect the environment? Um, how is your, uh, you know, what your company is doing going to affect the, the um, say, if you're making food, um, for example, is it going to uh, damage people, the food products? Are they going to be safe? And there's all sorts of factors where the government is under a lot of pressure to get the companies to, um, to, to follow um, what the needs of society. So for, it might be that 
we've got massive unemployment in one region. We've got oh, we've got we've got uh, more than enough uh, work in another. Then government is under pressure to get companies to move to the area that doesn't have the work. Um, but the companies don't want that. They don't want anybody to interfere because that will affect their bottom line. That will affect their profits. So that's why the capitalist companies and their political representatives oppose tooth and nail planning. Now there is some element of planning in capitalism, of course, um, but they 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 run it to the minimum uh, as little as they can. But if you see if you see the results of planning in uh, countries, well, we saw it in the Soviet Union. We see in China. Planning is is is, the, is it makes a huge difference to the outcome of the economy. I mean, look at the the latest plan that the Chinese have just adopted, the fourteenth plan that they've just adopted a couple of weeks ago. Um, they're lay, they're laying out what do we need to invest in to be able for China to become the most efficient and most advanced country in the world. Uh, how much housing do we need for the new for all the workers that are going to be created by the growth of the economy and so on? So, you know, without that, you get chaos and. And I'd like to give an example of that in my own personal experience of of what happens um, <clears throat> when you don't plan. And this is the day to day running of how uh, capitalist economies operate. So I live, you know, I, I, right now I'm, I'm living in, in Brazil, but my I have a, my home is actually in Turkey. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm born in Britain of Irish parentage, but the, you know this is the modern world we're in, isn't it? And um, uh, in my area in Turkey, which I know very well. Um, we, we, we live in a touristic area near the sea, near the Mediterranean. And I can remember back in, <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the last 20 years, um, there was a period when tourism was really rising. And so what then happened was almost every business in Turkey of any size and, and a lot of rich people, they suddenly thought to themselves, ah, the tourists, the tourists are coming to Turkey in big numbers. Let me build a hotel. And so they set about building hotels. So we ended up, we ended up in um, in the Antalya region and the Mula region. We ended up with thousands of five star and four star hotels. We, we've got more than any other place in the world. And as a result, and um, what was the end result of that? <clears throat> uh, of course, there was a, a glut of uh, uh, it was too many hotel bedrooms seeking too many too few tourists. And this arose because there was no planning by the government, no interference by the government. They just let people spend their money and build these hotels without any thought, without any planning, without any, um, you know, integration or coherence. So the end result was that <clears throat> that hotels in the, all these hotels, they, they barely make money. And in fact, to, it's to the benefit, I suppose, of the customers because they get very cheap hotel rooms. But uh, it was a complete waste of resources, and it's led to the fact that the workers in those hotels tend to get very badly paid. Yeah, but please overworked. let me let me just say one thing here because uh, it, you know I, I don't think it was uh, I don't think I'm entirely on board with the idea that it was in in the full benefit of the uh, of the uh, tourists because uh, look the tourists when you go to uh, you know I come from Bulgaria okay I'm originally okay. from Bulgaria we also have <laughs> touristic areas which is like we're a neighboring country to Turkey yeah. and you know the Black Sea coast and so on and so forth and we've had the same thing like you know in the 60s for example there were there was this careful planning and let alone that it had its uh, uh, its problems, okay? But there was a lot of careful planning and, for example, of establishing sea resorts. Mm -hmm. And there were towns established from, from built from scratch, like today it's the norm in China. But, uh, you know, in the 60s, in Bulgaria, this was something, you know, a, a symbolic uh, civilizational achievement, okay? And and these towns, these villages on the sea coast, they would win architectural uh, prizes and all kinds of things on world contests and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Whereas now what happens is like pretty much everyone, like in Turkey, builds a hotel uh, and the view is grotesque. I mean, everything is so ugly, so, uh, you know, uh, um, kind of uncomprehensive. Like, yeah. It, it's, yeah. there's uh, no aesthetics to that. There's no functionality. It's just hotels, casinos, uh, and, and all kinds of, uh, you know, yeah. nightclubs. Uh, so it's not really benefiting anyone, okay, in the final aftermath. In the final aftermath, you get, what you get is chaos, financial, uh, 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 aesthetical, and it's just making things uncomfortable for everybody in the final aftermath because those who build the hotels, they are not able to actually uh, cash in on them uh, to the extent at least that they mm, expected. And the people yeah. who go there, they go less and less just because it's not so <laughs> not, not such a great fun to go to a place which is so overcrowded and overbuilt. 
Yeah, you're you're right, boy. And uh, it's good that you pointed those things out because you're right that the the architecture is chaotic, uh, so it wasn't aesthetic. The effect on the environment, even the tourists themselves, um, they arrive in these often they're all inclusive holidays, and they stay in the hotel almost the whole thing, and they, they it's like as if they aren't in the country. They don't get to see much of the country. Um, so you're right. That definitely, there's all sorts of even for the even for the tourists themselves, uh, there are a lot of downsides to this. But overall, I mean, the, not planning this, it, it, it obviously leads to this chaos leads to all sorts of downsides. Another example I'd like to give from my region was uh, was the farmers, and um, there was this. Uh, there was a, a um, uh, you know there was a lot of uh, farmers who were not making much money. And, and then along came the idea that they should um, plant pomegranate trees, you know, the, the fruit with all the little red seeds in them. And the, the advantage of the pomegranate trees, trees is that they are, uh, the fruit is not only, uh, was, quite, was quite expensive at that time. So, you know, it was very profitable, the idea of that. But also, um, you know, pomegranate seeds are used in a lot of um, trendy, uh, but good, uh, you know, they're very good for medicinal purposes and health purposes, and they're sold in a lot of formats in the health shops around the world. So this uh, also increased their value. So then what happened was that the farmers, uh, again, because there's no, there's no coordination, etc., cetera, they, um, they just willy-nilly all over the place, they started planting these um, pomegranate trees. And, of course, what was the end result? That you had pomegranate trees everywhere. And where I live in, in Turkey, the, all around me are pomegranate, pomegranate trees. And then, of course, the price of the pomegranates fell through the floor and then all the farmers started complaining again. So then they started to think, maybe I should plant tangerines. And, and, and so it goes on. Um, and, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so that is the chaos of capitalism. And one of, the, one of the big problems that also occurs through this is that it's one of the underlying reasons why we have this very destructive business cycle in capitalism, whereby um, you, you get, uh, you get a, a rise in a boom in, 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 in the capitalist, capitalist economy. And then production gets to a certain point. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's not enough, there's too many goods chasing too few customers. Uh, and there's also a, a fall in the rate of profit because of this. Uh, you also then get a fall of investment and then you get a downturn. And sometimes those downturns can become very severe, as we saw in the Great Recession in 2008, 2009. And I suspect it's going to be even worse in the crush that I think is going to come in the 20s, 2020s, because of this massive debt we have now. So, you know, so it's altogether a, a, a really bad aspect of capitalism. Now, in a democratic socialist society, um, we would obviously want to plan the economy. Um, and uh, now that planning in that sense is, is uh, being implemented. It's not a new, we're not inventing the wheel, as we said earlier. Um, Planning has been done in, in many uh, socialistic countries in the past and has worked. The difference is in our case is that we won't want we, that they've been top down planning. So the worst example was in the Soviet Union, whereby they had a command economy where they tried to plan everything and they tried to set all the prices centrally and so on. And that didn't work. Yeah, starting from the price, exactly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That was really and, price control uh, yeah. obsession rather than planning. Yeah. Well, it's, well I, I, we would like to see a much more democratic, we have to see a much more democratic form of planning that also involves um, the people who are affected by all the plans. But I'll come on to that in more detail in, in uh, another session when we talk about that. Now, the, the next issue I'd like to talk about is uh, democratic public investment. <clears throat> now, the key problem in the, in the capitalist economies today is, a, is the lack of investment. Uh, we see this in, in uh, the way that, that we have uh, infra the way that infrastructure is falling apart and we don't have the growth of infrastructure that we need to have. Like if you compare um, the capitalist countries of the West with what's been happening in China, you can see straight away the massive difference that China is, China has gone from having hardly any rail network to now having um, ha over half of the high speed train trains in the world. And they're, they're, they're um, and it's dramatically improved the productivity of society uh, the comfort of society. Uh, uh, let me media. just let, let me just make one uh, uh, one point here uh, that uh, unlike China, in Poland since 1989, uh, where I reside currently in Poland, uh, mm -hmm. we had mm, in 1989 in 1990 uh, about 33,000 
uh, kilometers of a uh, rail network. Okay, now mm -hmm. we barely have fourteen thousand, and uh, the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation here in Poland announced a couple of months ago that what they have now in terms of resources for maintaining the infrastructure they've got maybe for 10,000 kilometers so this is this is how uh, this is what happened in terms of investment or or lack of investment uh, after uh, or within the process of restoration of capitalism in in Poland when it comes to you know infrastructure and investment i just wanted to give like you know a striking contrasting example you know to yeah. uh, to what you describe uh, is going on in china Yeah, well, um, it, but it, funny, even when they do decide to invest in infrastructure, as the, uh, there's an example, there's a train line that they're planning to do from uh, the south of England up to the uh, Birmingham. Maybe if they're lucky, it'll go to Manchester, although that, that part of the line seems to have been uh, uh, thrown away now. Um, and, the, and it's called the HS2 line, I think they call it. And um, the, it's going to cost them something like 40 billion pounds And it's going to take them 20 or more years to build. Whereas the Chinese could knock these, can do them at good quality at, in about five years, you know, maybe less, you know, incredible. And at a fraction of the cost because they become the, the masters of this stuff, you know. Um, so because, because these investments are, are becoming so expensive and because they take so long to, to, to build, The, the capitalist companies are not willing to, uh, uh, and their, you know, their shareholders are not willing to wait um, for that return. They, in fact, they, they kind of limit returns to, they have to make their money back and make profits after three to five years maximum. And they're not willing to make long-term investments. Um, that, not only that, the, the capitalists themselves, they're, they're, a lot of them are sitting on great piles of cash. I mean, like Apple is sitting on 200 billion dollars of cash um, because they find it more profitable to do that and invest it in um, in the stock market or or buying back their own shares or all kind of ways than it is to invest in in, in even in new technology um, and and of course when when cap capitalist companies do invest um, they're not doing it for the benefit of their workers their customers or society as a whole they're just doing it for their their own company's profit and we can see this dramatically exposed in, in new technology, can't we? I mean, you know, uh, the future of, of, of uh, technology, you know, robots, automation, um, artificial intelligence and so on, I mean, these should offer us a fantastic bright prospect, you know, greatly increased wealth, um, leisure for humanity. I mean, it, wouldn't it be a fantastic world where, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, robots and other automated systems are doing all the boring drudgery of work. Absolutely. I mean, they're Absolutely. They're yeah, but you're done to actually to, to, um, to pursue, you know, uh, creative pursuits. But that's, that's exactly, there. of or course, things, because this is, like to do, you know. yeah, 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 because this, but that, that's what automation and technology would be uh, like in a rational society, okay? In, exactly, in a rational yeah. society and, and a planned economy, because in a chaotic society, which is based on some, uh, you know, anarchic uh, economic system, which makes everybody compete for, you know, the, uh, the, the, the last penny, okay? Because there is... Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's deficits of everything all right so yeah obviously this is endangering people and it only you know uh basically produces an anxiety uh in the societies and and, and uh you know that in turn produces all kinds of other uh processes you know social cultural and so on and so forth uh which are uh you know very difficult to deal with and and, and are largely pathological but i i think that this is the main uh point proving the um uh the superiority okay of planning and the superiority of rational uh allocation of resources and and and, and energy uh human energy and and uh human invention and all of it that it could actually every uh every idea every uh mm, concept Every, uh, you know, the potential of the society could actually matter, okay? Everybody could have a say in how things are developing, how they are unfolding, and how the process is, uh, you know, of production or service or whatever is is actually uh, shaping up. And, and this is, you know, the main 
difference. This is the main fundamental change that we want to bring about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be the key, one of the key issues for the future of humanity, isn't it? You know, and and, and when you say that this is rational, um, I mean, it is actually for the rich. Maybe it's rational that they that they only look at what benefits them. But for the whole of society, I mean, you know, new technology is bringing, we can see it's bringing incredible riches for the few, but, you know, the danger is it'll bring poverty and unemployment for the many, um, for the rest of us. Uh, an example, look at, look at um, the characters who are emerging in the new technology world. Uh, Bezos, uh, Elon Musk, Zuckerberg. These, these are the rich, some of the richest people in the world. But look at their companies. They, they, um, they're non-union. And any worker who tries to join a union is out. Yeah. I mean, these, these are people who are so rich that they could easily, even pocket change out of their money, could afford big pay rises for their Absolutely. workforce. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's ideologically. Them, they're, paying them, they're paying them minimum wage. Yeah. Um, they and they have to apply. Were, yeah. They yeah, they have to apply I mean, for social security afterwards, right? So this is yeah. like they work full time in Amazon or 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 other, you know, uh, Silicon Incredible. Valley company and stuff like that, and they are not able to sustain themselves. Okay, so this is absolutely pathological. While those people sit on millions, right? Like I don't know what Jeff Bezos is at the moment uh, worth, like three hundred or four hundred or five hundred billion dollars. I don't know. I've yeah, lost yeah. the count. It doesn't matter. He can never spend that. Right? He doesn't care. In fact, the irony is that he doesn't even care about this. This money yeah. It, yeah. and then when they're questioned about it they don't i mean when you go who could ever spend one yeah. billion never exactly. mind 200 yeah. billion it's just ridiculous yeah. right yeah um, yeah and, and they they actually um uh you know but they, i think they, they, <clears throat> Yeah, sorry, I wanted sorry, yeah. to say that, that that I think it also makes sense to point out here that the Silicon Valley is not a capitalist success. This is not a symbol of capitalist success because the Silicon Valley has been largely, you know, the uh, companies there, okay, those mm -hmm. that uh, compose the sure. the kind of uh, notion of, you know, Silicon Valley invention, uh, mm -hmm. inno innovations and so on and so forth. That was a plan, okay? This was a plan of... Uh, of the, of the government of the American government back in the seventies and eighties that they want to invest and they they could that it could be that they could achieve strategic superiority in this particular field of IT technologies and so on and so forth so they were actually you know that's how the incentive was created by the government by the uh, by the powers that be at the time in in, in Washington and then you know. There were millions and millions of dollars flooding, okay, from the central federal budget to, uh, you know, through all kinds of organizations and mechanisms to those companies that so that they could have established what is, I think, a monopoly or almost a monopoly at the moment. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you if you go into any one of those individuals, you find that uh, behind this kind of glitzy success that's portrayed, there's actually all sorts of subsidies from the state, um, and and they've often you know, they, they benefited, like Apple, you know, most of their Apple's inventions were all actually developed in universities at public expense. And they found a way to combine and market them better, you know, and, or for example, um, uh, Elon Musk, I mean, he got, he got, a gov the government gave him the factory in California, um, effectively lent him the money to get the factory. Um, uh, <clears throat> Zuckerberg, uh, is taking advantage of all the um, the internet infrastructure that's being built by public spend public spending and public invention. So, you know, it's there's only so that you know that they try to give off the fact that these are great innovators, but they're only taking advantage of a lot of public things. Um, and uh, you know, one of the one interesting thing I'd like to point out about this is that you know movies and art often in very interesting ways reflect the reflect society. Uh, in 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 uh, um, quite accurately, and it's very interesting that if you look at science fiction movies in the in the fifties sixties, there were some science fiction movies that actually portrayed a kind of hopeful future. But all the science fiction movies nowadays, it's a dystopian future. Yeah, where, apocalyptic, totally. Yeah, apocalyptic. You know, where a few corporate yeah. uh, evil. Owners are trying to manipulate this, that, and the other, and the yeah. mass of people are living in shacks and 
Yeah, or in some kind of post-nuclear uh, conditions. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. And then it's, it's always right. raining. And yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. But, 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 but I know, think and it, I think that reflects the kind of lack of confidence they have. And you know, uh, this is the future of humanity it doesn't have to be like that at all. Quite absolutely, the opposite, absolutely. Right? But I think it's also important that because uh, we're talking now about uh, democratic public investment, and I think it's important mm. to uh, stress on the fact that uh, the investment that was made by the American government in order to create what is now largely referred to as the Silicon Valley is exactly right. undemocratic. It's just a decision by some people who sure. thought that, okay, mm. that could be something that we could beat the Soviet Union on, and so, things like that, right? Where it, it was not something that the society will finally benefit, benefit from it. Definitely. It's benefiting from it, okay, may, partially to some extent. It's benefiting from it because, but 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 it's a side effect, okay. It's it's not something that was actually in it that, that mm. I was planned. Investment um, needs to be uh, uh, um, decided by society as a whole, not just by um, you know a few key uh, bureaucrats or, or uh, you know companies. And the same with innovation that that. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, the way the way that uh, inv innovation budgets are, are used is decided by a small little coterie of big business and top officials in the appropriate government departments, and and that's why, for example, over fifty percent of the budgets of uh, national budgets on science and research and development tend to go for military applications, which is certainly not what the public, if they had the chance to have a say on this, would want. They would far want far more want investment in um, you know innovation uh, investment in innovation in uh, you know uh, pharmaceuticals to uh, how can we solve the diseases that we've got um, how can we uh, you know on the on uh, solar energy I mean you would not believe the lack of investment on solar energy historically it's been pathetic I and mean, it's, it's changing now but it still needs to be dramatically improved and if we could if we could improve the efficiency of solar panels, for example, and wind turbines and so on, we could dramatically accelerate the switch over to clean energy. Um, and and so um, there's all sorts of ways that we we could we could do that. I want to thank you for uh, you know explaining the concepts that you uh, put forward at the beginning of the program, and we're going to continue this discussion in our next uh, in the next edition of uh, Divided We Fall. I want to. Uh, appeal to all of you to uh, go to our YouTube channel uh, to see other productions that we've delivered so far and to uh, go to the website, uh, thebarricade.online. I'm sure you're going to find a lot of interesting uh, materials there and uh, visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash thebarricade because we are the independent media that depends on your donations and subscriptions so thanks a lot pat and i'll uh, talk to you again in a couple of weeks all the best to everybody uh, to everyone watching and stay healthy ciao thanks Brian.